All right, folks, back again. Once again, you're, you're probably getting used to seeing this backdrop, and it's just because there's so many incredible companies out in Cornwall spearheading innovative space flight and space technology. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Hi there, so I'm Josh Weston, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of SpaceForge. Really, we're a materials company first and a space company second. What we do is produce semiconductors, the inorganic crystals that make up computer chips. Right now as a company, we do that on the ground. From later this year, we'll be doing it in space. So that is now your focus exclusively, is superconductors being manu or semiconductors, I apologize, being manufactured in microgravity. Tell us about the advantage of manufacturing these sorts of things in a microgravity vacuum environment. So a combination of the microgravity and the purity of space vacuum allows us to create crystals up to five orders of magnitude higher in purity compared to the ground. Specifically, what I'm talking about there is what's known as the dislocation density. That's basically how well does your crystal lattice structure actually match up. So on Earth, when you produce a semiconductor, you get these tiny little cracks down it. They almost look like canyons. That prevents electrons from moving across and heat from escaping. In space, you don't have that as a problem. That comes because basically all industrial processes have to overcome the boundaries of Earth. The gravity that weighs us down, the dense, um, uh, the dense ambient atmosphere that we breathe, and the fairly consistent temperature. Those three things you don't have in space. You have microgravity, you have an abundance of high purity vacuum, and depending on which way you're facing, you have plus or minus 250 Celsius. For industrial processes, like in-space manufacturing of semiconductors, that gives you a phenomenal running head start. So in terms of manufacturing in space, there's a lot of folks who've been doing it on, or well, starting out anyway, with satellites and such, including some experiments that have been done in space recently. They brought their, their samples back down in Australia, that sort of thing. All right, so, but your focus has always been semiconductors and not things like pharmaceuticals as these other companies are working on. Yeah, so we actually started with our payload technology to produce semiconductors. We are material scientists and spacecraft engineers at heart at SpaceForge. We're not pharmacists, we're not biotech people, we're not pharmacologists, and we don't pretend to be. We focus on the things that we know and we understand. Ultimately, it's a similar process, same sort of thing. Protein crystallization is very similar to semiconductor crystallization, but at the same time, they are also worlds apart. Pharmacology can take place at tens of degree with tens of watts. Some of the semiconductor processes that we undertake don't even start until you reach 1200 Celsius. So tell me something, um, and, f and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you started to expand your operations here. Yes. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, so we, uh, we have a new site in Florida. Uh, that's our Spaceforge Inc. HQ. Um, that's spearheaded by the incredible Michelle Fleming, uh, who used to run microgravity research for Zero-G Corporation before coming over and joining us at Spaceforge. Um, we've also just uh, doubled the US team in size. Uh, we've had Atul Kumar join us as our VP of Semiconductors. So he's now traveling from state to state, looking for the perfect place to establish a pilot line for our materials in the US. Um, and we're actually about to add a couple more heads. So uh, in, a, in the space of about six weeks, we'll have quadrupled the US office in size. And what sort of uh, experiments have you done in microgravity vacuum? Have you, I know you attempted to send something into space from Spaceport Cornwall, and what have you done since then? So it's important to say that pretty much all semiconductor processing already takes place in a vacuum. That vacuum, however, is the vacuum that we have the limitations of here on Earth. So uh, since that launch attempt, we have expanded our materials production significantly. Um, in fact, we're actually just about to open up a brand new semiconductor factory in Swansea, in Wales. Um, that will be the first of many. We are also looking to establish one of those here in the US and another one inside the European Union. Um, we have three missions coming up this year. Um, two which we're, to be honest, we're not really talking about. We are taking some fairly big risks on those missions. We know what it's like to take a, mi a risk with a mission. 
I also don't want to talk about it in advance, so I don't have to relive that pain again. But the capstone mission this year is Forge Star 1. Uh, so just about three weeks ago, the Civil Aviation Authority granted us the license to perform that mission. Um, the first time the UK has granted a, a license for an in-space manufacturing uh, platform and the second country to ever license uh, an in-space manufacturing mission. So incredibly proud of that. The team have worked remarkably hard and put in all of the shifts to enable that platform to go ahead. Looking at shipping that stateside in a few weeks, really that's there to pipe clean out the manufacturing technology and demonstrate elements of our re-entry approach. Now, last question. Obviously, and I've, I've asked this question to all of your colleagues, at least here in this booth, given the shifting geopolitical nature of what's been going on, do you feel that there's opportunity for sovereign launch providers in Britain to launch your, launch your satellites that may not have been there before? In short, yeah. Um, working across semiconductors and spacecraft, we work across the two most geopolitically tense environments that there are um, in an ever-changing world. Um, I, don't, I don't always tend to think of it as sovereign access, uh, sovereign access, but what I do think about is assured access. Um, and having an abundance of providers provides me with the assurance that I'll still be able to launch. Um, and that's really what we look for. I mean, first and foremost, reliability, and then I start to worry about pricing. Um, you know, despite, despite some of the setbacks we had, we'd absolutely be willing to go again on UK launch, um, but we won't limit ourselves to it as well. We will, we will launch and return to the locations where our customers and our partners need us to be. Well, I've always looked upon you folks as being an incredibly innovative UK company and uh, very excited to see what you're going to do next. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Lenori Takahashi. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Space Borders. Uh, thanks for joining this session. So, yeah, I'll start. So, this picture is uh, kind of uh, the reason we start this company, Space Borders. So, the science fiction vision of the space. So, we have already always have uh, this kind of large buildings. Yeah, but uh, we got shocked. We realized we cannot create such kind of building by using the current technology. So we decided to start the company. Yeah, so let me start from here. So how much do we rely on infrastructure on Earth, I mean? Like water, transportation, cars, energy, so these everything is uh, based on infrastructures. So how about space? Like as you know, there is uh, only ISS and several satellites. But is that the space uh, future? What do you had a dream? So maybe not. So now the rocket technology is brilliant. So the uh, cost disrupting happens uh, thanks to the uh, new technology. But the in terms of their space infrastructures, there is no such kind of innovation yet. <coughs> uh, but uh, we believe uh, we need to increase the, increase the space activities, otherwise uh, we cannot make these two cy cycles uh, well. So now uh, we have issues uh, about our space infrastructures. The cost is pretty much high. and. Uh, to build it, it takes a long time to build. And also the design flexibility is uh, quite uh, few. So we want to solve uh, lower cost, less time to construct, and also the design flexibility by using our technology. So how? Uh, sorry. <laughs> so our mission is to uh, enable to use the space resources, uh, and also the, we want to create a new culture and the new industry in space. So it's gonna be uh, totally different from what uh, we are doing on Mars. So, you know, we can expand the human possibility by using uh, the space. Yes, so the solution, concept of operation is here. Uh, we launch sucked panels with our robot systems. And then uh, first uh, deploy the solar panel and then our uh, construction robots start to work. So first, we semi-assemble the panels into positions. And then, completing that process, our welding robot starts to move to conduct welding. So put the panels together. So we can make pressurized modules too. Why we choose welding? So 
uh, other like mechanical, deployable, inflatable technologies uh, here, but the welding is the most reasonable way to make the larger scale of infrastructures. And uh, we actually develop our own own robotics because uh, the arms, for example, the current uh, robot solutions cannot conduct the welding because the welding is pretty tiny, uh, accurate process. So the beam's diameter is only 0.3 millimeter. So it's difficult to control, so we decided to develop our own robotics. So you can see the, our progress of the development. So we can successfully conduct the welding in the atmosphere uh, environment. And also, uh, we conduct the uh, welding uh, quality check in the space vacuum conditions. So if we combine uh, robot systems and the welding gun together, so we can conduct the welding in space. So we want to uh, verify this kind of processes. So our lab is like this. Meeting. <laughs> After this, you can see the quality of the welding. Uh, it's pretty much better than what I can do. Yeah, like this. So two panels are quite well assembled by welding processes. Uh, we do mechanical uh, metal processing by ourselves. And this one is a semi-assembled robot. So at least three robots uh, work together to handle the panels into position. Yeah. Okay, so we move on. Uh, all the, these are the equipment, oh, sorry. All these are the gun and the power supply system and the robot system are all in house made. So we develop all by ourselves. So by using this construction technology, we can provide uh, such a large uh, scale station modules. So. Uh, we can uh, have a flat scale, for example, so we can put a larger window by comparing to the current uh, construction methods. So, for example, the habitat modules, like hotel use cases, uh, we can have a like, restaurant bar, entrance, it's kind of like building, not like room. And also, we can provide lab modules, it's kind of like science park. So we have an artificial gravity circle, gravity generation circle, and also we can put the several uh, general parts per equipment. So we can send a command uh, to conduct some exper uh, experience, and then like we can uh, download the analysis results on the ground. And we can also provide the larger reflector antenna uh, for the telecommunication satellites. So it's uh, we can uh, able to uh, communicate directly from the satellite to smartphone from the geo. geo. Now, for the habitat measures, uh, we conduct it uh, kind of like a, uh, safety verifications for our very little wall. Yeah, we already checked. And for the lunar construction, uh, we uh, put uh, gun and uh, battery systems into one package and we provide for the lunar robots uh, company and the rover companies. So this is our milestones. Uh, now in 2025 we are going to uh, zero Z gravity test with the space vacuum chamber so we can see the quality of the routing and also uh, our uh, big uh, chamber to AC test we can do that. And in 2027, the beginning of the 2027, we are, we sent our welding gun and the battery system uh, into the ISS, so we can see the quality of the welding, double check, and also uh, how how maintain how sustain the gun works. And the December, the end of the uh, this year, I uh, know uh, in 2027. Uh, we bring seven panels as building materials, and forwards, and weld them together. So we can show our capability of uh, new construction methods and to end process. Uh, but it's uh, just a front panel, so we want to make it uh, pressurized modules in 2029 and going to be commercialized in 2031. 
Folks, you had an opportunity to hear that presentation. Now I'm here with the CEO of Space Course. Would be so kind just to introduce yourself to the viewers real quick? Okay, uh, I'm a CEO of Space Quarter, and my background is mechanical engineer. So I design all robot and uh, electron beam gun also. So uh, this is my idea origin from my ideas. Yeah. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about this. This is this is your hotel setup, right? Is that right? Is that the overall design? And so you're thinking um, also doing laboratories and uh, and uh, manufacturing facilities also? Yes, with our technology, we can uh, build this kind of huge module. Uh, the, the size is 35 meter and 27 meter and 4 meter. It's uh, with only single launch. We can make this one. Then the, the application for this module is many. Or one Example is hotels, uh, habitat, and uh, of course we can uh, make a laboratory also, and uh, of course also factory is uh, one option, I think. So your robots, I saw them in operation. If I come to Tokyo this year, can I see your robots? Yeah, of course you, of course you can see. Uh, we can demonstrate uh, in our laboratory. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm coming to Tokyo then. I'll stay in touch with you. Thank you so much. Appreciate. Thank you. All right.